Mm, all right. Hey, Gene, thank you. Uh, Steve Greenberg, uh, as I understand it, controls the court courtroom. That is the word from, uh, from Jeff Gold, who was in the courtroom for the first day of jury selection. And we're so glad that you're with us here today, Jeff. So it. when you hear Steve Greenberg say that, you know, say, say that they're, they're so ready for this, uh, what, what is the dynamic with Steve in, in, the, in but, the courtroom? I mean, it's interesting. He's the third man, but you say he controls it. Well, physically, I thought that. I, I said so to him in the hallway last week. Um, you know, look, there's, there's a lot of egos when you put a lot of lawyers together on one case. There's six lawyers, six defense lawyers on this case. Um, and I think Steve is giving a little bit of his own opening on the courthouse steps there uh, to our correspondent. I mean, that's, that's what was going on. Joel Brodsky is actually going to give the real opening, but here you've got a little preview by another lawyer who wants to get his words out there. Mm -hmm. What do you say to the main, and it sounds like this is going to be the main argument, not only was it an accident, but maybe the biggest obstacle for the prosecution is they cannot place Drew Peterson at, at the house unless there's something they know that they have not revealed. Is there anything the prosecution can do to overcome that one fact? Uh, look, this is a weak case for the state's attorney, a very weak case. And everyone knows the invisible 800-pound gorilla is Stacy Peterson's yeah. death. They will be able to touch on that tangentially, but not in the way they wish they could. They wish they could have a witness come in and talk about a 55 a uh, gallon blue drum in Stacy Peterson's case, they can't. They really are going to have a very tough case. There isn't much here. Um, it's going to be uh, uh, shocking to me if the defense loses this case. And I think that's the only way that Drew Peterson loses is if the defense loses the case. So it's not so, I mean, it's partly about how well the prosecution does, but you think you think the burden in some er in large part lays on the defense to do a good job. Well, of course, the, technically the burden isn't on them, but I will say right. this. Us watching it now, we know that Jim Glasgow, the state's attorney, has got a tough job, a mm -hmm. very tough job. There is a wind at the defense's back here. They have seven men and five women. That's a good jury. They are happy with this jury. I mm -hmm. sat in and watched jury selection and was making my own notes as to who I would want as a defense attorney, and they got a good jury for uh, the defense. Um, the state ha asked very little questions during voir dire for the jury selection, is apparently going to give a very small opening, and I understand that because of the, the lack of certainty as to whether the judge will allow all those hearsay statements in. But it is the defense that really has uh, the wind at its back right now. All right, Jeff, some people may take offense to this because they're joking and they're laughing about Stacey Peterson as though she's going to show up. But it's a very serious situation. This is a mother of two who disappeared, who many people believe was killed by Drew Peterson. To show that kind of air beforehand about the elephant in the room. Damaging at all, do you think? Well, there's two things I like to say about that. Number one, there is an old expression uh, that laughing juries don't convict. That if you get a jury inside the courtroom to be chuckling and laughing, it's very difficult for them to also convict somebody, uh, certainly of something of murder. Those two things don't go together, a lighthearted spirit and conviction of murder. On the other hand, I don't agree with the tactic uh, of being overconfident and uh, somewhat sarcastic. Uh, I think that that just really feeds into the public's perception, certainly, of the way Drew acted with the media. And now his attorneys are acting that way mm -hmm. with the media. I don't believe in it. I, I, I think you sit down and shut up and do your case. I think they've got a great case to work with as defense attorneys. They don't need this media war. Mm. All righty. Thank you so much, Jeff and Jean. Uh, opening statements. Uh, I want to bring in Jeff because, uh, Jeff, uh, you were saying that you were in an interview last week with um, with Joel Brodsky, and he said something that struck you. What was that? Well, I, it was unbelievable to me, but he said that he was going to show in this trial that Drew was not nearly as evil as he had been portrayed. And I thought to myself, well, is that 98% as evil as portrayed? 95% yeah. yeah. as evil as portrayed? I couldn't believe a defense attorney would make that statement. I, I guess it's a slip, but gee. Mm -hmm. And what about the fact that that we saw Steve Greenberg talking to the media just before he goes into the courtroom. You say that is, 
that's so unbelievable to you? Why, well, why so? You know, look, there's going to be an opening. It's going to be widely reported. Uh, you know, there's really no reason for him to give a little press opening, and that's what he's doing here. I just think that these attorneys are um, overdoing the press. I don't think this case needs to be, at this point, uh, done in the press. They have a very strong defense case in that the state's case is very weak. Uh, there's going to be an opening in a few minutes from now. Why do this? Look, that, that's his choice. The attorneys try their case, and I'm just sitting here on the sidelines, so he may be right and I may be wrong, but I, I just don't see why. How, how strong is the possibility, do you think, that these questionable hearsay statements that we're waiting to see if they come in, what does the prosecution need to do to secure their admittance to this trial? Well, is there anything they can do? Yeah, they're going to have to show to uh, Judge Ramilla that these statements are reliable. Judge White, the prior judge who made rulings that most of them were unreliable, that still will be considered by this judge. He hasn't decided. It's going to go statement by statement. Every time the state wants to get one in, judge is going to have to make a determination, are they reliable? And, it, and look, a lot of it, are any of them reliable? I mean, look, you've seen them. Are any of them reliable? Well, look, what the problem is is that is that the crucial ones are hearsay upon hearsay, meaning that it's not about what Kathy uh, said or uh, about her state of mind. It's about Kathy saying Drew said he's going to yeah. hurt me, he's going to kill me. And it's now, like the telephone game. That's right. And you have three levels of it. You have. Um, Drew apparently saying it, that's the statement that goes to the decedent who's now dead, who's now told it to somebody else, a preacher or whatever else, who's now going to come to court and say these things. Mm -hmm. So um, they're, they're double or triple hearsay. That's the unreliable part. It's going to be for the judge to call it. Okay, Gene, let, let me ask you real quickly. Uh, one of the things, as I was reading up on this last night, that I, I find can be, what do we know about financial motives? In this, in this trial? Well, it's disputed. The, the defense says there was no financial motive, that there really was very little at stake when you get right down to it, and the prosecutor said that's the motive in the case. We have to remember that motive is a big deal here because the state just doesn't have that much to hang its hat on, so motive is everything to them. Uh, it's important to the state. I think the judge is going to let the state do as much as it can on, on motive uh, as uh, possible, and the defense is going to complain all at once, but um, you know, it's going to be a, a, a decision for the jury to determine mm -hmm. what weight to give it. Was it a lot? Was it a motive? Was it not? That's going to go to the jury. Mm -hmm. And let me ask you this. With the, in those 18 domestic violence calls, and this was part of what I wanted to get at, too, uh, between uh, it was Savio and Drew Peterson. He was never arrested. 18 calls. She was arrested twice. He was never arrested. Is there a, is there a threat to the defense that this man got preferential treatment throughout this entire fiasco? Well, I mean, the fact of the matter is it's probably true. How much the jury will get that, how much will come in through evidence of that, who knows. Look, the domestics are very common in, in America. It's common for people to charge each other, go to court and dismiss him, go back to being married. That's a common experience that most of the jury will know, not just personally, of course, I don't think many of them have been arrested from my recollection, but nevertheless, through family members and whatever else, it's common. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking earlier, look, O.J., O.J.'s case was full of uh, uh, evidence that there was going to be a threat to kill uh, Nicole Brown Simpson. That went into evidence uh, from a locked safety deposit box, and it didn't matter, and he was acquitted. So uh, it, it's, it's evidence in these cases, whether or not it's determining evidence, we'll have to see. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Is there any pertinent law that would limit what the state can say in their openings? Well, I think he's technically right in the sense that there's no case law saying he can't say it in opening. Now, on some of the things that are extremely prejudicial, for example, let's say the judge knew that the prosecutor was going to say something blatantly false, uh, maybe the judge would curtail that. And I think as to this hearsay, which he hasn't made a determination, he may c c curtail some of it. But on the other hand, generally the prosecutor has his own noose here. Mm -hmm. And he says what he wants to say, and he's going to be held accountable at the end of the case by the defense and by the jury if he doesn't fulfill what he promised. So the judge is going to give him wide latitude to say what he wants to say and see what happens. This was never processed as anything other than an accident scene. Jeff Gold. Uh, how, how detrimental might that be to the defense? Is that a big deal? Uh, look, that, he, he, everything in this case to me is about that first autopsy, uh, the, the uh, inquest that occurred after it, and the fact that they ruled it as an accident. And mm -hmm. now the state has to explain it. That is a tremendous sty in the eye, so to speak, for the state to have to overcome it. They can overcome it, but it's a big deal. 
Um, and I will just note factually, her hair was wet and her fingers were pruned. So mm -hmm. likely there was water in there that had drained out or something else. It wasn't totally dry in that sense that it was dry when they came, but there was evidence it had been wet at some point, or at least she had been wet at some mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a problem for the for the state, but they can overcome it. Well, well, they have to sell have to sell the guy who, who testified for the state at this coroner's inquest uh, down the river that he didn't do a very good job. That's the only way they're going to. Right, right, and and this is my question. The, uh, Joe was sitting here yesterday and, and said he he saw the autopsy report and it never said accidental draw, drowning. That was left to a coroner's jury. A six-person jury who determined that this was an accident. How does a jur a yeah. six-person jury get to determine what goes on an autopsy when they never examined the body themselves? It's an old-fashioned procedure, generally done away with now. You don't use them anymore. Its findings are not binding. The state did not have to go by those. Sometimes you use that to dump a case. Mm -hmm. You know, most you know they say in a grand jury, for example, you can indict a ham sandwich. So the only time somebody doesn't get indicted in the grand jury is when the prosecutor doesn't want the person indicted. Well, I don't. Know know in this case how this happened, but sometimes you bring it before such an inquest because you want them to take the heat. They didn't say it was homicide. Okay, we leave the case alone. I don't know if it happened here, but it is a way to dump a case. Mm. All right. Hey, Jeff Gold, thank you so much. Uh, hey, uh, we're getting... Okay, and Jeff, let's go over that. What specifically is the best evidence for the state? It has to be the, the cause of death. They have to go on that autopsy. It's the only thing they really have. Um, other than the hearsay statements. If you really look at there's three things. The best for them is the autopsy, of course, the second and third, the second mm -hmm. autopsy. Sure. Uh, then there is the hearsay statements that come out of Drew's, ma Drew's mouth, allegedly, and then finally the issues of motive. But the autopsy is everything to them. They have really nothing linking Drew to the scene. This is a very weak case. That's the best they have. So don't two autopsies um, give us some reasonable doubt? Look, uh, the fact is you have the first autopsy closer in time. That's the one that's the best, theoretically, uh, chance to get exactly what happened. Here you have another one three and a half years later uh, of a body that's exhumed. So is that reasonable doubt? It certainly could be reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, arguments apparently are now over. I want to give you an update as I'm getting it from the courtroom right now. And, and Jeff, I'm wondering how... How helpful is that for them to, you know, we've seen a couple of cases this year where they weren't allowed to take notes. How much of a difference does that make? Well, you know, it used to be that jurors weren't allowed to take notes, and over time it's become more common for them to take notes. And the reasons for saying they shouldn't is that, well, the notes start to take over their recollections. And then those jurors that took good notes, their recollections seem more important than the jurors who didn't take notes and mm -hmm. don't really remember them. But generally the trend is to allow them to take notes, give them cautionary instructions that the notes themselves are not the evidence, but just mere recollections, et cetera. So it's a helpful thing though. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jean Casara, so we know that uh, James Glasgow herself, I mean, there were 18 calls of domestic violence. They're gonna try to paint her as you know, a, a crazy person herself? Well, you know, that depends on how much comes in for on the state side. Uh, I, I want to go back one, just for a second, to the 15 minutes for the yeah, prosecutor. Ahead, I think the prosecutor is a very uh, calm and measured fellow, and he is going to do everything he can to make sure that if he gets a conviction, it can't be overturned. That's why he's doing it this way. It's, it's a big contrast to the defense, which seems to be gregarious and outgoing in terms of all its statements to the press. The prosecutor is appropriately very low-key and is going to do that in front of the jury. He's done it so far with jury selection. He's continuing to do it now. And I think that's the way you win a case by being a prosecutor, not a persecutor. Mm, very good. Hey, I want to read one of, the, uh, one of the statements here that's in question. This was a statement to Mary Susan Park. She's a student in the nursing program, uh, and she was a, a co-student with Savio at Joliet uh, Junior College. Uh, and apparently, uh, this, was, this was done in, in late, uh, I think, late October. Uh, but but some of these statements talk about the fact that um, Peterson, she says, entered her home surreptitiously, grabbed her by the throat, told her she should die. Uh, this is what Savio is telling Mary Susan Parks, who Parks will also say that Savio told her Peterson said he could kill her and get away with it and that he could kill her and walk. That is a, a, an actual, supposedly, allegedly, statement. That is not this is how I feel. That is, this is what he said. Right. And how much more weight, Jeff, does oh, yeah. that carry? Right. The things that he said are going to come in. That's you think, what I you think. You think that statement is going to be Yeah, I think admitted. that anything that Drew said 
uh, is likely to come in, although there's, again, the question of hearsay. The, the things that are about state of mind of, of Kathy, they're not coming in at all. That, that's not, it's been talked about in the media, but that's not coming in. These okay. are the things that have to come in for the state to have a chance to win. It's a sparse case. They need these things. And I think that the, they'll come in with an instruction that the jury can assess their weight.